I do. Hey, Marty. Hey, Bill. Hey, Ron. Hey, Paul. Hey, Steve. Hello, hello. There's a That's Ned up in my. Yep, we can hear you. All right. Dana, good seeing you also. Hello, everybody. We'll start, we'll start with the prayer request and ask uh, uh, Dan's going to actually lead us in that because he texted me he has a prayer request that's kind of urgent this morning. Okay. Um, my cousin's husband about uh, 15 minutes ago, they took him to the ER because he had a parent heart attack. Hmm. So, um, just want to pray that that, that isn't it and that uh, just something the aid or something like that. But also he and my cousin are not saved that's the more urgent thing is to yes. hopefully this incident will wake them up to the need for relationship God. and the one that had the heart attack or potential heart attack uh what is their name his name is jeff his wife's yeah. name is colleen so he has some he has some very a bunch of health issues they've been dealing with all his life so it's very concerning because it could be a lot more damaging to him than somebody else that's in even regular shape so all right well dan i hope you don't mind but while we're at it why don't you not only open us up in prayer for breaking bread but i want you to lift jeff up and we're just going to agree with you this morning okay. is there anybody else that needs anything yes pray for me my uh, that my back continue to heal Ned. I know I was op operated on uh, on the 24th, so uh, that it continues to heal. Thanks, and, Ned. And my fibro is kicking real bad, so also for my fibro to improve. Okay. Did you have something, Lee? No. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. Okay. Oh, I no. did. I did. Yeah, I got you. Uh, All right. All right. Dylan, we Go just ahead. come to you today uh, first with uh, <laughs> praise and thanksgiving um, that we uh, have the ability and the freedom to come and collectively uh, worship you through uh, fellowship and through learning your word. Uh, we just pray that you yeah. will. Uh, Bless this time and uh, that your word will uh, go deep and uh, nourish our uh, spirits, that we will go out and uh, bring more people to you, Lord. Lord, we come to you now with some uh, health issues uh, for uh, Ned and his back, that you will uh, continue to heal him and that he will have 100% uh, healing and mobility with that. I also pray for Bill and his fibromyalgia right now that you would just give him uh, relief and comfort from that. And Lord, we just pray that you will, will heal him of that, that he won't have to deal with that anymore. Lord, uh, also pray for my mom, uh, that uh, you would help her with her neck and uh, back pain that she's having recently. And urgently come before you now, Lord, as a group to pray for uh, Jeff and Colleen pray first and foremost for their salvation, that you would use this incident to, to give them a bit of a wake-up call, that there's more to us than what we do on this earth and what's going on in this earth, or that, that there's eternal living and there's consequences to not having a relationship with you. I also pray that this is just a mild thing that this is not uh, a heart attack and that uh, we would just uh, bless that miraculously if need be Lord and just pray that you will watch care over uh, them give them some comfort and peace to know that you are God and that you are in control just pray for uh, Lynn, as he uh, speaks to us today, that you'll just uh, 
continue to use him as a conduit to, to make us uh, stronger with you, Lord, and have a better relationship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And amen. Yeah. All right. I also wanted to let you guys know uh, Donna's not here with us today. She is freezing her buns off in Missouri. Um, but uh, it's for a pleasant reason. Her sister has her 80th birthday party. So she went up to Missouri to go honor her sister. So she said to say hello to everybody. And she'll be back next week. So. Go to chapter 14 of the book of Romans as we finish up chapter 14. You guys ever struggle with gray areas? You know, yeah, you can't turn to Colossians. You can't turn to Ephesians. You can't turn to the gospel of Mark and find a clear cut answer about what you're supposed to do in a particular situation. Um, or a controversial situation. Should we sprinkle? Should we dunk? Should we do baby dedications? Should we do baby baptism? Should we um, listen to praise and worship via an electric guitar or only through an organ and choir? Should we um, marry Jill? Should we take the job in Poughkeepsie? Um, I challenge you that if you if you do find any references in there, they're going to be a little confusing, not clear cut on some of those issues. And on other of those issues that I mentioned, the Bible is going to be absolutely, totally silent. So we're going to call those gray areas and we all run into them. And frankly, most of our life functions in these gray areas. I don't know if you would agree with that statement or not. But it seems like most of our life is filled full of stuff that I can get general guidelines from the Bible, but I'm not going to get specificities about certain decisions. Should I buy that car or keep my old used car? Should I move to a different town, a location? Should I change churches? I mean, life literally every day is filled full of these gray areas. Paul's going to talk to us today along the same theme that he talked last week, but at the end, he's going to talk about these gray areas, and, and I hope that we'll have a really good discussion this week um, on this, since I plan on finishing early. I know none of you ever believe me anymore when I say that, but that's okay. So if you will turn to me, Dana, smirking. Yeah, don't choke, Dana. It's okay. There's no one there to do the Heimlich. Um, Go to Romans 14, and we're going to start with verses 14 and 15. This week, I'm reading out of the New King James Version, which is my default <laughs> version. <clears throat> if I ever change that up, I'll let you know. I'll give you a second. Paul writes, speaking in himself in the first person, I know and am convinced. Well, that's pretty, pretty strong. I know and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him, it is unclean. And we're going to expand on that principle in a moment. He continues, yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. So do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. So a little context here. Before he was the great apostle Paul, this guy was Saul of Tarsus. This is before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And Saul of Tarsus self-described as a Pharisee of Pharisee the keeper of rules, the ultimate legalist and persecutor of Christians. Um, this guy epitomized legalism and rules. And yet he opens up and says, I know and am convinced by debate, by lecture, by introspection. Nope, because he met the Lord Jesus Christ, that nothing in and of itself is unclean. He has gone from the strictest of legalists to the champion of liberty because of, of his experience 
with Jesus in the desert. When he says all things are clean in this context, initially he's going to broaden the he's going to broaden the, the scope here in a minute, but initially he's talking about food. And as we discussed last week, there are all these food regulations, and um, some were aimed at the Gentiles who were coming out of pagan religions, and they didn't want to eat meat that had been sacrificed to false idols. And some of these food regulations came from the Jewish Christians, and they couldn't eat certain foods because they weren't kosher as a Jew. So you had all these food regulations. It's something that really doesn't bother us today, but we're using it as an example of what Paul is talking about when he comes to the thing about liberty versus rules. Um, there was nothing, no matter where you stood on your rules, Paul makes it clear, hey, I know all things are clean. In other words, I have freedom to eat whatever is in front of me. But nothing can justify the destruction or the harming of a Christian believer over food. Now, what does this mean? So Ned is a Jewish Christian, and he's still functioning half in the Jewish world. And certain foods, well, let's say pork, that's a no-no. Now, Paul knows that really it's okay to eat pork. It doesn't offend God, doesn't offend Jesus. It's okay. But instead of trying to convince Ned that he's operating in some legalistic rules that don't apply anymore, Paul says, it's better just not to eat pork around Ned. Don't, don't mess up Ned just because you have liberty to eat whatever you want. Now, when Paul is speaking about this everything is clean and, and don't worry about all these little things, he's talking about um, minor things. He's talking about what we called the minors last week instead of the, the majors. Little indifferent things, which, by the way, are far more plentiful than the major things. You can probably count the major things on your digits, but the minor things number in the ten zillions. So he's not talking about major issues of sin and faith that are clearly spelled out in the Bible. Um, Lee, you can't use this um, uh, passage to justify having 12 other wives along with Dot. Okay. First of all, you wouldn't make it past the first sentence with Dot before she would put an end to that. But secondly, that's clearly spelled out in the Bible. That's not what Paul is talking about. He's trying to make a point. You guys have liberty, but you need to emphasize walking in love. The issue here isn't the fact that every one of you have this tremendous personal liberty. The issue is, are you walking in love towards another that Jesus has come and died for? You see, love, by its very definition, foregoes its own rights in order to promote the welfare of another. So a dish of food, it's not as important as the spiritual well-being of somebody who Christ died for. And yet, what do we have? And again, this is kind of an indictment of America because it's the way we were formed and founded and it's what we emphasize. And you, you don't necessarily see this in other countries to this degree. But we are all about championing our individual rights and our individual freedoms in this country to the extent, and you guys don't like this, and, and I don't necessarily like it, to where in media, for instance, other people's views are constantly being rammed down your throat, right? Personal liberties and rights are not just enjoyed in this country they're used to bludgeon other people who do not have those same morals or values. They're used to bludgeon you in the head relentlessly with. It. This is the exact opposite of what Jesus is talking about. Jesus says, listen, as a Christian, you guys have ultimate rights, but you're going to miss the boat if you 
beat other people in the head with those ultimate rights. Um, the way to really look at this, if Jesus was willing to give up his right to live, and there is no stronger right than that, the right to exist, and he gave up his life for the sake of a, of a person, of a believer, then I can certainly give up my steak dinner. And what, we'll get more into this in a minute, because Paul's not going to let up off the gas. But do you guys get that so far before I move on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Verse 16 through 18. He says, therefore, and you have to see why is that therefore? Therefore, so his prior point, he's bridging to this point. So therefore, if the emphasis should be on love and not on your personal rights, therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is, is not eating and drinking. No, he's going to tell you what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And how much does God value that? Uh, for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men, In quote. That's through verse 18. Now, it's, it's now time. It's Paul's favorite time. If Paul is with me, I don't know. I just see, um, oh, no, I see him. Oh, there he is. He hears me. Paul, it's story time. So don't fall asleep during story time. Uh -huh. Now, I'm telling you, this has been a pox upon the church since there was a church. We do not get along. I told you last week, they shall know you by your love for one another. And all we do is fight internally and pick at each other's differences and try to argue and convince that your view is not right concerning the stained glass windows versus the metal building and blah, 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 blah. And you know, that's all the world sees. You want to know why the whole world is just flocking to us? They're not being drawn in by love. And, and we're at fault. Now, if you think it's just us, the rank and the file, uh, that have this issue historically for 2,000 years, let me enlighten you. You guys know that one of the guys I like to quote from, I like the way he writes. He was a tremendous biblical scholar uh, and a tremendous pastor, preacher, evangelist by the name of Spurgeon. Right? I quote from Spurgeon a lot. Here's an interesting factoid. Charles Haddon Spurgeon had a running feud, almost a lifelong feud with another great contemporary pastor that uh, by, the, by the name of Joseph Parker. And these two were considered great men of God, used of God, tremendous ministries and outreach, tremendous understanding of the word of God. And, and here's what, what, what was going on. Spurgeon didn't like Parker because he couldn't understand how a fellow minister like Joseph Parker could go and sit in a play in a theater and watch a play. That was just incomprehensible to Spurgeon that he could debase and lower himself in that way. Oh, but Joseph Parker wasn't gracious towards Charles Spurgeon. You see, Spurgeon had a habit. Spurgeon liked to light up a big stogie and smoke a cigar. Mm -hmm. And Parker could not wrap his head around how a minister of God could be sitting there smoking a big old stogie. Now, some of you who may be historians in the crowd may know the, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. But from what I was able to read, this feud lasted their entire lives. Now, let me ask you a question. Can you turn to somewhere in the Bible? I'll let you even go Old Testament. Turn somewhere in the Bible and tell me that specifically, specifically, that cigar smoking is a sin. I said specifically, not generals. Yep. Can you tell me specifically in the Bible where it says it's a sin to go in a theater and watch a play? Okay. Would you agree with me that these were minor issues? Mm -hmm. And yet two powerful great men of God who existed in the 1800s 
known for being used of God in ministry, had this ongoing and, listen to me, public feud. Okay? It's one thing if they did this behind closed doors. What message do you think that sending to the people who would sit down and listen to Spurgeon when they just read about this tiff in the paper? Is that an attractive message? No. So the church is just, it's a pox. It's a plague that's been upon the church that we've ignored this section of Romans for 2,000 years and very successfully ignored it. By the way, as a, an aside, a footnote, this is how life really works. Not due to anything Joseph Parker ever said to him, Spurgeon later in his life is sitting back as was his habit and he's going to light up a big stogie and he's going to read the paper the london times he opens the london times and there inside the london times is this huge ad from a cigar manufacturer with a very simple heading the cigar that charles spurgeon smokes he put it cigar down and he never smoked again he convicted him i wasn't joseph parker that was the holy spirit my point being this is a problem that we all deal with and it's constant it's ongoing where we're not loving and gracious towards our fellow brother we don't like where they stand on this issue or this issue politically or this issue socially or this issue and yet those issues are not really clear cut spelled out in the Bible. So we're going to major on the minors and have a division. And God says, that is never right. You are always primarily to get along with your fellow believers, no matter where they stand on all these superflu superfluous issues. And you're focused on what you have in common, which is salvation through Jesus Christ, which is 99% of your DNA at this point. And you're going to sit there and fuss and argue over the 1%. Moving on. Do not let your good be spoken of of evil. What does he mean by that? Our liberty and, G and freedom, which we have in Christ. And we have this freedom from the law. And it's 613 rules and regulations and, 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 and all the legalism. And we're free from all that. Praise God. But if you use it to destroy or harm another brother or sister in the Lord, then that can be rightly spoken of as evil and not freedom. This is Paul's point. The kingdom of God isn't eating and drinking. He's saying, get your priorities right. Don't major on these minor issues. Um, what is important? He tells you righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you place your emphasis on these minor issues, then you're hopelessly out of touch with God's priorities and God's heart. Now, that may seem like a pretty harsh statement for me to make to you, but it's true. If you find yourself majoring on the minors, you have missed the boat. Human relationships are more important than silly rules. Your focus should be on righteous, righteousness, peace, and joy in the spirit. And, and, and I'm sorry, that's black and white. That's not subject to some kind of twisting of interpretation. Anybody could read this and anybody would walk away with the same conclusion. Now, I grant you, there are many things in scriptures we scratch our head and don't know. What does it mean here? And what does it mean here? And you know what? This isn't one of them. This is as plain as the nose on your face. And he, and he says, listen. If you'll, if you'll pursue the righteousness and peace and joy of the Holy Spirit, if you'll pursue that, you're acceptable to God. You're pleasing to God. Serving God with that kind of a heart is the behavior that pleases your dad. You want to know how to please God? Just read that one passage. You read, you do that, and you are pleasing. God, God gets a smile on his face and goes, way to go, Ron. Way to go. That's what I like to see. I don't like to see arguing over meaningless rules. I like to see that. And that pleases God. 
Now, this part about approved by men, you can misinterpret that part, okay? We already know if you're following Christ, you may get persecuted by men, not approved by them. So what did Paul mean when he said approved by men? So what he means is when you're looked at by the world, non-believers, they, they're weighing you on, on one of two points. Are you sincere or are you hypocritical? Are you sincere or are you a hypocrite? And they're weighing you constantly on this. And Paul just simply says, you walk in righteousness and peace and join the Holy Spirit and you'll be acceptable. Um, you'll be approved by men, which simply means they will look at you and judge you as at least being sincere. Now, they may then take you out and feed you to lions, but there won't be any hypocrisy in your message. There won't be any two-facedness in your message. And this behavior of love, now think about it. Think, what is God's ultimate game plan here? What is, why is God trying to pound this message home to the Roman church and to all the churches of Jesus Christ? It's simply this. <clears throat> the behavior of love one towards another draws people to Christ. But meaningless rules and bickering about said rules repulses, repels people from Jesus Christ. God is all about trying to bring as many people into the kingdom as possible. And for 2,000 years, predominantly, the church has been all about repelling everybody. You would not have the number of denominations that we have, the splendid little churches that we have if it were something where we were all loving on one another. So verse 19 through 21. So Paul says and concludes, and with another therefore, therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and let us pursue the things by which we may edify one another, to lift one another up, to encourage one another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. And I'll explain that. It's an awkward wording, but it'll make sense to you in a minute. It is good neither to eat nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended, or is made weak. So what Paul is basically saying here with that little awkward phrase is, is if eating or drinking or exercising any of your Christian liberties, rock music on a guitar, um, you know, meaning in a steel building and trying to convince them that that's the only way to properly spend God's resources, if, if anything that you do will stumble another believer, then you're not free to eat or drink or stumble them. <clears throat> Even if you do have the personal liberty, you never have the liberty to cause another brother or sister in the Lord to stumble, to weaken them, to offend them. Now, let me give you an example. Let's say um, Dana. Dana has um, a glass of wine with dinner at night, maybe a, a, a Pinot, or maybe it's a, a Merlot, depending on what their dinner is for that evening. Just a simple glass of wine. Is, it, is that forbidden in the Bible anywhere? No, I'm going to answer that for you. No, it's not. Okay, so Dana has a little glass of wine, not 20 of them, one glass. There we go. It's in his plastic it's in, his, it's, it's, in, it's in his solo cup right now as we speak. Um, and you wonder how he gets through breaking bread. This is how. Um, so he's going to a dinner party and he's going to bring a bottle of wine as a nice gesture, as a, as a guest in the home. But he becomes aware that somebody there is a recovered alcoholic. Okay. You know what Dana should do? Slip that bottle right back into the bag from which it came 
and and don't is is Dana free to drink wine at dinner? Yes. Should Dana respect that other person and the issues that they may have with alcohol? Absolutely, yes. Because you're to function in love and not in liberty. You have liberty, but you better prioritize love. Let's say um, Bill likes to go to Vegas. He goes and takes in a few shows. He loves Celine Dion. I don't ask. I'm not, I'm, it's not judging him. Um, and he goes to Vegas. And while he's there, he likes to go to the $5 blackjack tables. And he goes all the way up and down the strip. And he's so far behind the times because there are no $5 blackjack tables. But finally, he finds from the, the, the nice man at MGM Grand that if he crosses the street and he goes to New York and New York, they still have some $5 blackjack tables. So he goes across the crowded street, goes into New York, New York, looks around, goes all over the casino, finds them. And you know how he finds them? They got about 10 people deep waiting to play on the $5 tables, right? So Bill gets up there and Bill's got 50 bucks that he allocates to spend towards gambling entertainment, okay? And he doesn't care whether he wins or loses. The idea is he's doing it for entertainment and he goes and he sits down at the blackjack table and within you know, 15 minutes, he gets blown out. And he has no money, but he, he's not mad or sad or anything. He just leaves and goes on to a nice lunch somewhere, okay? Now, Bill can do that, but there are people who have gambling issues. That is not okay for that to happen for those people. For them, that is sin and that is wrong. If Bill has any exposure to that, pe that kind of a person, he needs to be sensitive to that weakness that that person has, okay? Example after example after example. You know, if your buddy believes in infant baptism and you can show him biblically, you think that that's not correct, but it's gonna, he believes so strongly in it, you're gonna create a rift between him and you. Paul's saying, Jesus is saying, God is saying, don't be a fool. What's more important, that or the unity and love of the church? You got 99% in common with this fella, and you're going to start picking at the 1% that you disagree with him on. This is what we do. This is what we've historically done. And this is dead wrong. Dead wrong. So Paul says, Therefore, let us pursue things which make for peace. Instead of bickering over these inconsequential matters, we should make every effort to maintain peace and harmony in the Christian church. Instead of stumbling others by insisting upon our rights because I'm an American citizen, dadgummit, and nobody's going to take away my rights and nobody's going to tell me what to do and man, 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 man. well, yep, you're a great American citizen, but I will tell you to your face right now, you are a lousy Christian citizen. Choose your, choose your citizenry carefully. Which is more important to you? Paul says all things indeed are pure. Paul's going to concede the point that those that are functioning liberty are actually in the right. And those that are still trapped in some form of legalism are actually in the wrong, but he doesn't care. He says, none of that stuff is important. What is important is unity and love within the Christian fellowship. It's better for you to exercise your liberty in private or with like-minded people than it is for you to go out and do it in public and risk stumbling somebody. I know pastors who drink wine. They never do it publicly. They may do it in the privacy of their own home among close friends who were like-minded, but they don't want to take a risk. They could, somebody could see them and like Spurgeon smoking a stogie, their name is in the newspaper saying the cigar that Charles Spurgeon smokes. You know, it's okay for me to drink wine, even though that person is an alcoholic, it isn't okay for him to drink wine, but they see Pastor Blobo doing it out there at the Italian restaurant and they think it's okay. It justifies them. We're terrible at rationalizing our actions. So exercise your liberty, exercise it in private, 
exercise it with people that you know are like-minded, but don't flaunt your liberty and certainly don't cram it down somebody's throat. Now, I'm gonna give you an exception. I've got a minute left for the break. There is an exception and it's a very notable exception and it's Paul's exception. Paul had an incident where some believers from a Jewish background were offended that other believers who are from a Gentile background were not circumcised. Let me ask you guys a question. Does circumcision save anybody? Nope. It's a minor issue. Now, Paul didn't cater to those legalists in this case. As a matter of fact, he backed them down. Why? Because with the circumcision came a whole host of other conditions and circumstances of salvation. And they were trying to impose Judaism on Christians and saying salvation is Jesus plus this and this and this and this. And Paul would not stand for that. He said, no, it's Christ and Christ alone. So he did make a stand on a major issue, and we have it captured in the New Testament for us. But that was a major issue, not the circumcision. It's all the other stuff of what they were saying with that circumcision that went along with it. And he went, nope, it's Christ alone. And you guys are wrong. And you need to correct your doctrine. All right. We're going to break. We're going to come back for the main message and conclusion. Verse 22, 23. And I will see you back here in one minute.